Good morning, River Valley. It's going to be an amazing, wonderful day. We are so glad that you are here to worship with us. We are ready to get this thing going. I just wanted to say hi. When do you start? Over at the gym. Yeah. Okay. See Stand together, please. Let's begin with a story that reminds us of our mission, our purpose in this life to glorify God and to bring people to Jesus. We start from the north, the south, the east, and the west. And the message of the good news of the gospel. Sing along, please. to do church and I'm glad you're here today that we can uh, make this not a 
in addition to the worship of our Lord, a rally point for the week to come, we meet around the Lord's table in just a little bit. Let that be the focus, that we come to the cross, that great ground that um, sets us level and gives us purpose and calibrates us for a week ahead in Jesus the Christ, that we might shout to the north and the south and sing to the east and the west and proclaim the good news that Jesus is alive, he is risen, he loves you, he died for you, and you can have your sin forgiven, live with him eternally in heaven because of what he's done. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and uh, let's uh, continue to worship. Father, we thank you for the day you've given us this Sunday morning that we can worship you. Father, we pray that um, you might hear our praise, the offering that we give you, and that it might be pleasing to you. May everything be about you today and for you and your kingdom's sake. And Father, um, we pray this, this hour it might uh, re revive us for a week ahead of serving you and bringing you glory. Lord, let it be so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship.
I love it. Go ahead and have a seat. I love seeing that video uh, during the chorus as the chains just dropping. And uh, anybody experienced that in their life? Christian, our goal is to get closer and closer and closer to the Lord as each day passes. Wayne Watson sang a song years ago and he said, I want to get so close to you that it's no big change on that day when Jesus calls my name. What if I? What if I? Hope you're going in the direction and you're not just sitting still. Lord forbid, going backwards. Closer and closer and closer. Being in that state of continual prayer and realization that God's with you. Getting into His Word, letting Him speak to you. Let the Spirit guide you in everything you do and say and honor. Let's endeavor. Let's endeavor to live out the words of this song like we worship Him with this man. Same thing, same prayer. So close, so close. Let's endeavor to get closer and closer and closer to Him. 
Let's sing one more song today before we meet around the Lord's table. And uh, I'll have a prayer after this, but let's just let uh, more or less this song be our meditation today. Telling the Lord that He is the air we breathe. He's more important than this physical air, this oxygen in this room right now. Because we need that breath to sustain us forever for eternity, even when this life passes. So close. When we realize what He is to us, it becomes easier and easier and easier. So, when we partake of the loaf and the cup, the symbols of Christ's body and blood in just a moment, let's draw close to Him and have faith and comfort in the promise that comes that says, when we draw near to God, He will draw near to us. Let's sing to Him. Let's partake.
Go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we are lost without you. We are desperate for you. And as we partake today of the, the bread and the fruit of the vine, we represent Christ and what he did for us on the cross. May we cling to you. May we endeavor to grow closer to you. May we be like the, the man that Jesus likened the kingdom of God to that, that sold everything he had to buy a field that had a pearl of great price in it. He might own that treasure. Lord, help us to be as radical. Help us to be as sold out and as um, committed to you. That you are first place, you are everything. We leave it all and abandon everything else for you. Help us to go close to you, Lord. We ask your blessing upon the loaf and the cup we partake of. We give thanks, Lord. For what this um, this activity that we do each week represents. May it change us and focus us and put us on a path to bring you glory and honor and praise this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to welcome you to River Valley Christian Church today. And it's just great to have you worship God in a time of personal communion. It's now a time for kids to depart. And I want to also do something we did last week at this particular part of worship. Why don't you stand? Would you greet someone around you? Would you introduce yourself? Would you learn the new name of someone you do not know? <laughs> which we just did, to the breaking of bread, which is the Lord's Supper, and the prayer, and we're all about that. Today, I want you to know we're on the brink of a, a great number of good, fun activities and ministries of the church. Uh, Tuesday is Hoop Sleep. If you have uh, children from five years of age up through high school, get them here on Tuesday night. Walk-in registrations. Uh, we'll have uh, four hours of uh, activity uh, Tuesday night. Then uh, Saturday early, I believe, starts at 9 o'clock. Is that accurate, Alice? What, what time does the coat giveaway start? Uh, well, the volunteers are supposed to be here at 9.30. <laughs> the event starts at 10 to 2. 9.30 be here, 10 giveaway of coats. Great ministry. If you know people in the community that need brand new coats for the winter, you get them here. 
And then at night time, uh, see, they come back for our fall festival. Jamie Abel, who uh, has uh, left her ministry down in uh, uh, Fort Lauderdale, has really worked hard to try to pull that together. It's going to be bigger and better than uh, we've done the last couple of years. And we hope uh, kids of the community, families of the community will join us on uh, Saturday night, the 28th. And, and she needs some help in the, in the uh, uh, kitchen. We can still use a little more candy to get away on that night. And uh, uh, we just got a lot of good things we're trying to do for the Lord, for people, for families, and children here at River Valley. Hope you have your Bible. Turn to Colossians. We're starting a brand new series. I do have some of these uh, new four lessons for our Thursday, Wednesday Bible study. I believe they're on this communion table at the back of the worship area. Uh, if you want to pick one up and if you would like to join us uh, on Wednesday and Thursday. Today we're going to look at Colossians chapter 1. And we handshake in fellowship because you are key figures here in the church. Uh, and, and because you're so key, be sure you take that white notebook in your row. Would you sign your name? Let us know you were here today. And would you also uh, uh, leave us any information, a way to contact you, and also any prayer requests. Pass that white notebook. This, this new sermon series gets us to look at Colossians 1. I want you to look at the first two verses and hear what it says. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. And then he's writing to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae. He's beginning to identify some of the key figures of that first church. I don't know about you, but I grew up in a little church in Kentucky, and they taught me a finger play when I was just a, a youngster. And you hold your hands kind of like this, and they say, here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the doors and see all the people. And you try to teach at the earliest of age that the church is people. The church is not a building. The church is people, holy people of God. And at the outset of this letter, Paul, who is an apostle, by the will of God, is the sender of this letter. He's affirming at the outset, I am an apostle. That means I'm one literally sent by Jesus to tell you, I'm commissioned, I'm empowered by God to be a representative of Christ. Now we believe Paul is probably in the later years of his life and ministry. Maybe he's in Rome. Acts 28 says Paul got to Rome as a prisoner. Well, he is a prisoner, we believe, from Rome writing to the church at Colossia. And he's encouraging them, though I'm in chains, mine aren't yet broken. Literal, but I want you to know you ought to be faithful despite my condition. And then he notes also there's another key person, Timothy, and he calls him our brother. Now, Timothy is probably the secretary there writing the letter out. And he's also one young uh, follower of Christ who is being mentored by Paul. And later we know that Timothy becomes a, a pastor, a preacher at the church of Ephesus. And later Paul writes to him two letters that bear his name, first and second Timothy. And then if you skip down to verse seven, which I didn't read, there's another key figure or two uh, in, in seven, Epaphras. Epaphras is the shortened name of Epaphroditus, who was probably the founding pastor of the church at Colossia. And so he's got Epaphras, who knows all about the people he first led to the Lord. And he's telling them, hey, Paul, would you write to them to encourage them to stay strong? Now, Epaphroditus also was a letter carrier of Paul to the church at Philippi. Apparently, uh, when Paul was uh, in, in, in ministry, the church at Philippi gave a letter to Epaphras or Epaphroditus and brought it to uh, Paul and he read it 
and thanked them and maybe appreciated the gift they sent along with that. Then he wrote a letter back to that church called the, the book of uh, Philippians. And Epaphroditus was the mail carrier for that letter from Paul. So there, there's a lot of people who, who worked with Paul. And then if you skip down to uh, chapter 4, verses 7 to 9, at the end of this letter, he mentions two other fellows. He mentions Tychus, a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant, and Onesimus, our faithful and dear brother. Now, Onesimus is kind of unique. We know who Onesimus is from a letter to Philemon. Onesimus was a runaway slave who came into the presence of Paul and was introduced to Christ and became a Christ follower. And a runaway slave in that day needed to go back to their master, but the master could not treat the runaway slave harshly. And so Paul sends a letter to Philemon and says, you welcome him. He's a brother in Christ. You can't treat him harshly. And then he also says, oh, by the way, I'm going to come visit you and see how you're doing. And so this is the kind of the community he has around him. He, we've got in the church an apostle. We've got a secretary. We've got the church planner. And we've got two letter carriers who are going to take this letter back to the church at Colossia. And then Paul writes to God's holy people in Colossia. Faithful brothers and sisters. And that's what you are. You're holy you're holy people of God. You're brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, it's not unusual for people who share something together that they kind of have a nickname. People north of the Mason-Dixon line are called Yankees. What are the people who follow the Green Bay Packers called? Cheeseheads. What, what are those people who follow the original Star Trek movies called? They're called Trekkies, you know it. Well, Paul is saying, hey, you've got fame, you've got recognition, you're holy people of God. And some translations will even say, you're saints. You're the saints of God. You're, you're the set apart ones. You're holy. You've been set apart from sin to walk with Christ. And that's why we get songs like, and when the saints go marching in, or when the saints go marching in. And that's us. We, the church, are the holy people of God. And then Paul doesn't forget another key figure in the church, God, our Father. You see, what made Jesus mad in the temple in his day was they, they made the, the place a marketplace when it ought to be a house of prayer. My father's house ought to be in the house of prayer. And then there also is, you can't get away from this. A key figure in the early church, and this church today, is Christ. Christ, who is Lord of all. And we serve together as God's holy people, the Lord of all, Jesus the Christ. Now what this letter shows, I want you to see, Paul, nor any minister, is a one-man band. Paul and every minister is probably just a conductor orchestrating the talents of many people to, to bring them together in harmony, to present a, a beautiful message, a song, or a story to the audience of one. And you see, we're, we're to tell the story of Christ that will draw others to him and be pleasing to our God. And Paul's underscoring that any work in God's kingdom. And, and, and an example is this week when we do Hoops League on Tuesday night, it takes referees, it takes coaches, it takes scorekeepers, it takes workers in the kitchen, it takes wretched sharp people. Personnel. It takes parents to get the kids here. And then it takes the kids to enjoy and cooperate and just play ball. But we do it together. We stand on the shoulders of each other. We're trying to accomplish God's will in both worship or work or play. 
And I, I might just say, if you're on the staff, don't forget, I'd like to have a 15-minute meeting right down front, right after church. We want to get together. We want to share Christ. We want to lead in a positive way. We, may, we, we want to make a difference as key figures in the church. Because we are to introduce to those young people next Tuesday, grace and peace to all from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And boy, I don't know about you when you read the newspaper or watch TV. <laughs> we need some grace and we need some peace in our world. And I don't think it really will come from peace accords. It will only come from knowing God and His Son, Jesus Christ. And if you agree with that, would you say amen? Amen. amen. We need grace and peace. Now, Another thing that's important in the church, beyond the key figures here, I want you to see Paul believes prayer matters. Have you prayed about anything that's going on in your life today? If you haven't, take this moment to pray to God and say, God help me with my situation. Paul was a leader who prayed for the church. Look what he says in verse 3. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. You, you, you might, if you know somebody in the road you're at right now, somewhere in this service, it, uh, John, you're going to have a hard time with this. <laughs> no, but somebody want to go over and sit with John. And, uh, <laughs> pray for the person somewhere nearby you, if not in your road. You just pick one out from your road and you pray for them. Lord, be with them this week and deal with them gently and bring them to you and help them in their problems. I'll bet everyone you hear today has some kind of problem. But you know, we need to know you're being prayed for. Look what he said. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. And prayer power makes a difference in the church. Years ago, I heard this was true. Billy Graham and his great ministry, uh, he, he used to have thousands pack a tent when he used a tent, and then thousands when he had an arena. His partner in ministry, uh, by the name of Cliff Barrows, who was a, a, a well-known singer and associate, he said the real power in their ministry wasn't Billy Graham in the pulpit. He said it's what the people who wanted Billy Graham to succeed did before, during, and after. They prayed. He said in every tent or arena, there was some designated area where people came before the meeting and during the meeting and after the meeting. And they were praying for the preaching to be effective. Boy, I, I wish you would just pray for the preaching today to be effective. You see, the Christians at Colossia were on Paul's prayer list. Do you have a prayer list? Uh, some of you do. Sometimes when we send out those prayer texts, people will ask me, do you have an update? And they'll point to something. And I say, well, right now, I don't have that list. It's on my phone. Some of you get a bulletin. Look at that prayer list. We're, we're trying to pray for you. We're trying to be sure you know you're cared about. We're concerned about your situation. And we get prayer requests all the time. So we make public. So we don't get it. We just asked our elders to pray. But the Christians of Colossia were on Paul's prayer list. And he, he divides up his prayer matters into thanksgiving and request and praise. Paul offered thanksgiving for the blessings that he saw in these holy people that he could count. Remember that song, Thanksgiving, count your many blessings? Paul counted some. Look what he counted. Verse 4, he said, we know your faith is in Christ Jesus. Thank God you believe in Jesus. Believe in Him. Believe in Him. And if somebody in the church, even a preacher, lets you down, you keep your faith in Jesus. We know you have your faith in Jesus. And we know you love all God's people. Now, why would you give away over 400 free coats unless you love people? That's what we want to do. We want to help children have a warmer winter. And so the search for solution in the problems of this world 
is with the answer that was always found in Scripture. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, but love your neighbor as yourself. And Paul says, your love is not. And then he counted this blessing. He said, the gospel is bearing fruit. You, you being here shows for 19 years of this November 5th, we'll be celebrating 19 years of preaching the gospel and people keep coming back. They're faithful to Christ, but they're faithful to each other and they're faithful to the next generation that needs to hear. And so we're bearing fruit and the gospel is growing throughout the whole world. Wow, we need it to go all around the world. But, but just think, this is the first century, 63 AD, and Paul is saying in that known world with their tools, their, their ability to transport the gospel and move from place to place with lesser tools of communication at, 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 than we have at our disposal, the whole world at that time is learning about Jesus. And, and that's why we do when we give an offering, we take 10% out and we put it into a pot for missions away from the church to spread the gospel elsewhere. We have a commission to go into all the world. And Paul used his prayer for them as encouragement. Think of, think of what he says. Your faith is in Christ. Your love is obvious. The gospel is bearing fruit and it's, it's so impacting the whole world. That's encouraging to hear. Ken Blanchard, a well-known leadership guru, emphasized that giving people positive strokes, pats on the back, or encouragement is essential. And he recommends every good leader to give at least 10 positive good remarks for every criticism you ever offer. And encouragement is not to make them feel good, but to encourage them to be effective. And so maybe today when you leave and, and you know something going on in somebody, like give them a pat on the back just for being here. Give them a, a pat on the back when they've done something you have noticed. Compliment the children who do things in the building. Tell them you saw them do something good. A, cu a couple weeks ago, Landon Coy offered the prayer. He, he's a newly baptized nine-year-old. And he offered the prayer for the adults meal. And he did a remarkable job. Man, we patted him, we, we clapped. We, we just wanted him to know we see him growing in Christ. Encourage him. Commend a single mom who comes here together. Commend the young couple that comes together. Commend the whole family that, that worships God here. Encourage every man and woman, every boy, every girl. Find something they're doing good and pat them on the back and tell them to keep it up. You see, if that happens, if there ever is a time you need to criticize and rebuke or correct, they might be inclined to listen to someone they respect. Okay, Paul also not only gave thanks, he often requests. He said, we're praying for you. He, he prayed to God for, let, listen to this, what he, he prayed for the church for, to fill you with knowledge and wisdom and understanding from the Spirit. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty deep prayer request. You might need to pray for somebody when they have wisdom in the situation they're facing. And I don't know about you, there's trying times that come to all our lives where we need to have wisdom on how to act, what to say or not say, and how to move forward to make our world better for Christ. We need wisdom. And the Bible says, if you lack wisdom, ask God. Be sure you pray for your situation. Ask for wisdom. You know, uh, wisdom seems like a funny thing among his people. Uh, there was a time I heard a guy had wisdom when he was selling a donkey. He was trying to sell a donkey. A city boy by the name of Kenny heard that the country farmer had a donkey for sale. And this old farmer was going to sell it for a $100. The farmer agreed to sell the donkey to the city boy and deliver it the next day. When the next day came, the farmer drove up and said, Sorry, son, but I got bad news for you. The donkey died. Well, he had paid $100, so Kenny said, 
Well, just give me my money back. The farmer said, well, I can't do it because I've already spent the money on the donkey. Well, Kenny said, okay, then give me the dead donkey. The farmer said, well, what are you going to do with a dead donkey? And Kenny said, well, you know what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to rattle him off and sell him. Farmer said, you can't rock off a dead donkey. Kenny said, sure, can. Watch me. We just won't tell anybody about it. Well, a month later, the farmer meets up with Kenny and asks, what happened to that dead donkey? Kenny said, I raffled him off. I sold 500 tickets at $2 a piece, and I have made a profit of $898. And the farmer said, well, didn't anybody complain? And Kenny said, yeah, just one guy, the guy who got the winning ticket, and I gave him back his $2. <laughs> <laughs> now, Jesus taught his disciples to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But we need the kind of wisdom that when we do our work in the world, we don't deceive us. We're authentic. And we do what God wants next when Paul prayed for wisdom and that the church would, in verse 10, live to please God in every way, bearing fruits in good deeds. And then verse 11, and God's power to produce endurance, patience with giving joyful thanks to him. We're to do good deeds in wisdom. We are to serve with power and we're to serve and never give up. Have his endurance and his patience. His prayer for the church was a request for strength, a reliance on God's strength, God's power. And I don't know about you, but I'm realizing this all the time. As I get older, my strength isn't what it used to be. I know we're in a marathon. We can't act like it's a sprint. We can't put it all out at once. But we've got to serve for the long haul together. That's why I keep praising our kids' church teachers. We're in our 19th week now where we have assigned teachers to teach during this hour. And we've gone 19 weeks where everyone assigned has showed up. That is something good. Now, I'm not telling you it's easy to recruit. It's not easy for everyone to show up. But it sure stops the panic that happens on a Sunday morning when somebody's on. And so I want you to know, because of that grind, because of that effort, because of that consistency we have, we're coming. More parents, more young people are coming. They're seeing our faithfulness. They're seeing the willingness of people to step up. And the struggle to do that makes us stronger. But the strength comes from God, not us. And Paul saw that kind of effort. What are you doing there? I, I want you to keep on preaching. Keep, keep on teaching every generation in the church there at Colossae. And then he offered praise to them. Here's what he knew about them. He said, when I see what you're doing... You are qualified to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of life. Because of what you're doing, you haven't earned it, but you're qualified. He, he has given you uh, the, the merit of honor to say you'll be with me forever. And then in verse 13, he says in those of the church, you were rescued from the dominion of darkness. And some of us, when we turn to Christ, our life was darker than it is right now. But the praise underscores the dramatic details of what God has done to save us. Can, can you just really wrap your head around what Jesus did to come to the world to save us from our sins? And, and the imagery of how that rescues us. Uh, there's a story I heard of a newspaper reporting that one evening a woman was driving home when she noticed a huge truck behind her that was driving uncomfortably fast and far too close to her. 
she stepped on the gas to kind of get some distance between her vehicle and the truck. And when she sped up, the truck did too. The faster she drove, the faster the truck did. This began to scare her, so she exited the freeway, but the, the truck stayed with her. The woman then turned into a, a main street, hoping to lose the pursuer in traffic. He ran a red light just to continue the chase. And reaching the point of panic, she finally whipped into a service station, bolted out of her car as she screamed, running into the uh, storefront. The truck driver sprang from his truck, ran toward her car, yanking the back door open. The, the driver pulled out a man hidden in the back seat, and the truth was the woman was running from the wrong person. From the truck driver's higher vantage point, he had spotted a would-be rapist in the woman's back seat of the car. And the chase was not an effort to harm her, but to save her. And he did it at the cost of his own safety. <clears throat> Folks, in some ways, that's how dramatic Jesus came to the world to save us. He had a higher vantage point. He knew what we needed. We were deep in sin and we needed a Savior. And he rescued us from the dominion of Darkness in verse 13b, he brought us into the kingdom of his son. The kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God. And then it says, in Christ. And I, I was sharing in my class today, how do we get in Christ? I believe we're baptized into Christ. In Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. And so we praise God for all these things that are part of our life and our prayers for one another matter. Our prayers for each other matter. And then quickly, I want you to see the rescue on our behalf that Christ, who is the head of the church, has done for us. David Robinson, look at this. we got nine key things. You just can't say enough about Jesus. And, and David Robinson wrote a book called Magnific Magnificent Obsession. David got the title from what he said was a born and grant again Mennonite youth who when he was asked what did Jesus mean to you, that young youth from the Mennonite tradition said, I will never, or David said, I'll never forget what he said. The young boy said, Jesus, Jesus, he is my everything. He is beautiful. He is my magnificent obsession. Wouldn't it be great that youth, when we teach behind the walls, come out and say, Boy, Jesus, he's my magnificent obsession. Paul was obsessed with the supremacy of Jesus. Look at all the things he said about Jesus. Jesus is the son, is the image of the invisible God. A little boy once said, Boy, if God is up there, why doesn't he just peek out and show us his face? What the little boy doesn't understand is, in Christ, Jesus did that. When we see Jesus, we see God. Our Father revealed himself fully in Jesus. And we sing about it at Christmas. Think of some of the songs we sing at Christmas. Oh, come let us adore him. In that song we say, word of the Father, now in flesh appearing. Hark the herald angels say, Veiled in flesh the Godhead see Christ the incarnate deity. A newer Christian a Christmas song says, Mary, did you know that when you touched that baby boy, you were touching the face of God? And, and when Mary held Jesus, she was holding God. Paul was obsessed with this Jesus that when you see him, you see God. And he's obsessed with Jesus that he's called the firstborn over all creation. Now, some people say that Paul might be referring to Psalm 87, uh, 89, 27, which is often referred to as a messianic prophecy, a prophecy that Jesus fulfilled. It says there, I will make him 
the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. And God did. God did. Do you remember when the wise men came to King Herod? Where is he who was born king of the Jews? And then they said, go to Bethlehem, and they found Jesus in Bethlehem. And Jesus wasn't the firstborn king. He wasn't the first king, but he was the greatest king of Israel. The greatest. Bob Russell said Solomon was called the firstborn of David, but he wasn't David's first child. Solomon was the most important child because he became the king out of David. And so when Jesus is called the firstborn of creation, it's not that he's the first thing created as a gift from God, whichever child he is, but he is the greatest creation on earth. Michael Bird wants you to know that Jesus is the firstborn, does not make him the created being. He's not a created being like cults say he is. But this phrase, firstborn, emphasizes primacy in rule, preeminence in role, and priority in rank. When you see Jesus, he's as first rank as you can ever have. Firstborn. And then also, I think if you, you go down there to number seven, it says he's the firstborn from the dead. And there he is, the first God ever raised from the dead to eternal life. He's the first. He is the greatest. But he won't be the last. One day we all will join Amen. that first one. Now let's continue on. We see he is also praising Jesus in number three. For in him all things were created, things in heaven on earth. Visible, invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Do you realize you are created for him, Jesus? Your design from the beginning of your birth was you were created to serve Jesus and honor God. And if your life isn't doing that, you're falling short of the glory of God. We're combination. Christ was a baby born in Bethlehem, but he was the creator of the universe. And yet he had all things created for him. He is the author of creation. He is the sustainer of creation. Some of you may recall several months back I, I preached on this subject and I showed you a video of Louis Gigliano where a molecular biologist pointed to the existence of laminins, which are large cell cohesive glycoproteins that are required for the formation and the function of every basic membrane in every cell of your or my body. When laminin is studied by the electron microscopy, it reveals that they are the adhesives, adhesives of the cells and when they're looked at under the microscope, they appear in a cross-shaped mole a molecule. Mm. In every cell, the adhesion is a cross-shaped molecule called laminin. Christ holds you together, especially through the cross. When I was young, we were taught the song, He's got the whole world in His hands. And he not only created us, he saved us, and he's got us in his hands. And he's the power behind holding us together, and that's why we worship him on this very day. Before he left the earth, before he returned to his father, what did he say? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, Jesus. So you go, you make disciples. And you baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you teach them everything I've commanded you. And I'll be with you always. I'll hold you together. I'll hold you together. Number six, he is the head of the church. He's the rock upon which the church is built. If someone comes to the River Valley and asks the question, who is in charge here, don't you dare say this is Kevin's church. 
Don't you dare even go to the elders and say, they are in charge. No. All of us have Jesus as Lord and He is the head of the church. We will one day stand before Him and be accountable to His word and will. He's the head of the church. Why? In everything that He might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all the fullness dwell in Him and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things. He wants to bring all people together under His banner, under His name, in His love. Whether things on earth, whether things in heaven, by making peace through His blood, shed on the cross. And so if there's anything going to bring the world together, it has to be Jesus. Jesus. Eugene Peterson says the message of the American church is, you can do it. But the message of the scriptures and Jesus himself is, I did it for you. I've done it for you. Will you trust me? And folks, all we need to do is to look to him, embrace the work he achieved at the cross. And we can't exaggerate the greatness of Christ. We must trust him. Because the preeminent person in history was Jesus. He is the head of the church. And I love that verse 19. For in him, God was pleased to have all the fullness dwell in him. When you see Jesus, you see God. Fully God. Fully. I want you to stand with me right now. I'm going to close. Praise him. Would you come? <clears throat> Max Lucado told this such story of something that happened in his ministry. He, he preaches in San Antonio. There's a professional basketball team called the Spurs down there. And one of the members of his church is a fellow by the name of Dave Robinson. Anybody ever heard of Dave Robinson? Big tall, seven foot one, uh, NBA player who was a two-time MVP, multiple time, a uh, most valuable uh, all-star, uh, multiple uh, NBA champion, just outstanding player. Outstanding player, but he attended that church. Max preached in. One time the church had a retreat and it was for men and they all came together and Dave Robinson showed up. And after one of the seminars and after one of the fellowship, they, they said, let's go play some basketball. And they asked David Robinson if he would come play with those men in the church at that retreat. And he said, yes. And so they got in their shorts and he got in his plain clothes and they went out to the court and there they stood all these middle-aged, fat, pudgy men playing basketball with this seven-foot-one phenom that God had created. And he said, oh, we were having the time of our life. And, and we were playing and occasionally he'd slam a little dunk here or there. But he, they said, we knew when he was playing this, he was just holding back. He wasn't playing to his full self. And then one time he was at the top of the key and he decided to let it loose. And they said he took one or two steps, jumped from the free throw line, and he slammed the, the ball through the hoop, hung on the rim, and it was shook. They said, we just parted like the Red Sea to let him through. And the men gulped when they saw David Robinson. All he could do, he just smiled. But Max said, he said, at that moment, these group of men knew they shared the same court with David Robinson, but they didn't have the same power he had. I think the reason Paul, the apostles, and all these key figures of this early church, they were convinced who Jesus was, he was more than us, better than us, greater than us. He is supreme. And you know, some of them maybe heard him command demons come out of a person. Or, or some of those were in a boat when he quieted the storm. Some were there when a dead man was raised up, or a dead daughter sat up, or the entombed Lazarus was raised up from the dead. He had all authority in heaven and on earth. And when he spoke, things happened. He was different. He was supreme. But because Jesus was human, 
he understood those people in us, but because he's divine, he could save us from ourselves and our sins. And all I just want you to do, if you believe Jesus is supreme, would you confess him as Lord? If you've never been, would you follow that up with being baptized into Christ? If you're saved but you need a home church, would you consider River Valley as a place you partner in ministry where Jesus is the head of the church? I just want to know, would you confess with me that Jesus is the Christ right now? I believe, I believe. that Jesus is the Christ, Jesus is the, Christ. the Son of the living God. And he is my Lord and Savior. God bless you. Be baptized if you need it. Choose your her valley if you need it. And forever let's serve together in his name. Come.
Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. As always, we hope that you will come to this building, worship with us side by side. But if you cannot, we are so blessed that you would tune in and worship with us online. And we will be back here every Sunday. Please come back in one way or another, worship with us. Keep God in your heart. Bless those in your path. And we will see you um, one way or another next Sunday.